Thanks, Jenny. Well, ladies, I am excited to be here with you this weekend. I love events like this. I love spending time with like-minded women, faithful women in worship and in learning and in growth. I love to hear your stories. I'll share a little bit about my story. And so in light of that, let's just get the ball rolling. Let me tell you a little bit more about myself. As Jenny said, I teach at Ozark Christian College in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, I am married. I've been husband, uh, mar- I've been husband. I've been married to my husband, Michael, for for 19 years, which is exciting and fun. Thank you. Um, we have two kids. Our daughter Claire is 12, and we just entered the world of junior high this year. Uh huh. But guys, actually, I hesitate to say it out loud. It's going better than we thought. <laughs> so knock on wood. Woo, praise God. Um, we also have a son. He is. His name is Carson. He's nine, and they're so much fun. Uh, I also have two golden retrievers that I absolutely adore, which means I also have a robot vacuum that I absolutely adore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what else? I, I love musical theater. I love the fall. I tolerate spring and summer. I do okay there. But I don't want to talk about the fourth one. I don't like it. Not at all. No. Um, Let's see what else. Oh, um, all things chips and salsa, please. Love chips and salsa. We could just do that. Yeah. Deep study in chips and salsa. I could do that. Um, And one more, I don't know, interesting fact. Not really a fun fact, but interesting. I am seriously visually impaired. Like, I cannot see very well. I'm wearing contacts right now, but even those don't work super great for me. I have never really been able to see very well. So, Sad childhood story alert. I got my first glasses when I was in the third grade. However, when I went in for my doctor's appointment, the eye doctor was dismayed at what he found. He he put the big glasses, binoculars thing in front of my face, you know what I'm talking about? And he slid a couple of lenses in place and he said, what can you see? And I said, nothing. So he slid a couple more lenses in front of my eyes and he said, how about now? And I said, nope. So he slid a couple more lenses in place, and he said, now? And I said, oh, there's an O. Has that always been there? To which he replied, it's a C. And yes. (laughs) Yes, it has. And so uh, suffice it to say, I should have had glasses at least when I started kindergarten, probably before that. But somehow, I had managed to skate through life only partially being able to see. Now, my mom says that two weeks later when we went back to pick up my glasses and we were driving home, I would not stop ooing and aahing. I read every street sign, every billboard, every storefront, all the way home. And then when we got home, we pulled into the driveway. I scrambled out of the car, and I went into our yard, and I just stood there looking up at this giant oak tree, my mouth just hanging open. And my mom asked me what I was looking at, and I said, leaves. The tree has leaves. Guys, I was eight. (laughs) And I told my mom that I thought leaves only took shape when they died and fell to the ground. And when I told her that I drew trees like a big fluffy cloud, not due to my elementary or rudimentary artistry skills, but that that's actually what I thought they looked like, my mom burst into tears. (laughs) So yeah, my eyes have always been bad. But a few years ago, I entered into a whole new level of sight sorrow. Guys, I had to get bifocals. <laughs> now, please understand, my mom was 50 when she started using reading glasses, and I teased her relentlessly. So now here I was at 38, starting to play the old trombone, if you know what I mean. And so, of course, you know, I have a super supportive mom, and so one day she sends me an email. And she says, it turns out... There's a whole new line of Barbie dolls coming out for the older generation, and I thought you might be interested. Oh, yeah. She says there's, a, there's Hot Flash Barbie. Watch Barbie's face turn red and perspiration grow on her forehead. She comes with a tiny package of tissues and a handheld fan. Isn't that cute? Then she said there's facial hair Barbie. Uh-huh. As Barbie's hormones shift, watch her whiskers grow. She comes, she comes with teensy tweezers and a magnifying mirror. It's adorable. 
And then there it was, highlighted in yellow just to make sure I didn't miss it. There's also bifocals, Barbie. <laughs> she comes with six pair of blended lens fashion frames and six wild colors a neck chain, and large print editions of Vogue and Martha Stewart Living. <laughs> oh yeah, she thought she was so funny. <laughs> so I quickly emailed back, I have no visual memories before the age of eight. Is there a bad mom Barbie in the lineup? <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> she didn't reply, so. <laughs> but we're fine. <laughs> we're good. Everything's fine. Uh, but, but here's my point. Here's my point. I think we can all agree that vision is pretty important. I mean, every time I've ever played the game, would you rather, there's always a question in there of like, would you rather lose your sense of sight or your sense of hearing or your sense of smell or whatever? And for me, it's absolute no-brainer. I would rather lose any of my senses, even my ability to taste a perfectly salted tortilla chip dipped in zesty salsa, than lose my sense of sight. I want to see. I want to see the colors of the sunset. I want to see the leaves on the trees. I want to see the laugh lines on my husband's face. I want to see my daughter walk down the aisle one day. I want to see my son become a father. I want to see. But even more important than all of those things is my ability to see God. Now, I'm going to make an assumption this weekend, and I know, I know, making assumptions is a very dangerous thing to do, but I'm going to assume that everyone in this room has come here this weekend because you also want to see God. And I fully recognize that some of you have met God. You have seen God. You have a vision of God, and it's a good vision of God. And so maybe you're here because you want to take that to the next level. You don't want to just see God, but you want to see what God desires of you in his kingdom. And that's good because we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about all of that. And the way that we're going to open that up tonight is by taking a deep dive into Psalm chapter 1. And so if you have your Bibles with you or you've got your Bible apps, would you turn your pages or tune that app to Psalm chapter 1. And as you're turning there tonight, I just want to say just a few introductory words about this psalm. Psalm 1, interestingly enough, in kind of the earliest manuscripts, the earliest writings of this book, Psalm 1 is actually unnumbered. It doesn't have a 1, which means that it's in there not not as a psalm like all of the other psalms. It's actually different. Psalm 1 is placed at the very beginning almost like an introduction or instructions on how to read this book. Psalm 1 is the instructions regarding the character required of us to engage the book of Psalms. How to read them, how to be transformed by them. Psalm 1 sets the tone for the reader. It essentially says this. Anyone who chooses to move forward in this book of hymns and songs is committing to not just reading, but studying. And not just studying, but obeying. Now, the righteous read the words, they meditate on these words, they are transformed by them, and they live in light of them. And the wicked, well, the wicked should probably just pass on by. Because God's word calls for change. It calls for allegiance. And if you're not willing to concede, then this isn't for you. That's Psalm 1. So that said, let's begin by reading this psalm together in its entirety, and then we'll move into the studying and the responding. Sound good? Psalm 1, verse 1. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree. Planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, but not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Now, maybe at first glance, this doesn't seem too difficult to figure out. 
There are some who do bad things, that's not good. There are some who do good things, we should do the good things, not the bad things, end of story. Theology 101, right? But here's the deal. When we linger just a little longer in scripture, oftentimes what we see is that there is so much more being said than what is being said. Sometimes if we just stay a moment longer, theology 101 doesn't quite seem so simple. Uh, my daughter was about three years old when we moved from Southern California to Missouri. And one of our major concerns when we moved is that we found the right church for her. See, we didn't want to just drop her off on a Sunday morning to be entertained for an hour and a half. We believed that even preschoolers could be shaping their vision of who God is. And so imagine our delight when one day we're driving home from church and Claire is looking out the window and suddenly she says, look at those beautiful trees that God and Jesus made. Well, my husband and I looked at each other with joy and we're like, yes. That's the preschool theology we're looking for. She knows that God's the creator. This is so good. And so we said something like, yeah, babe, isn't God an incredible artist? And then Claire replied, yeah, and they're cousins. Wait, what? <laughs> Hoping that we understood this correctly, I said, you mean the trees are cousins? And Claire said, no, God and Jesus are cousins. Oh, no. So my husband, you know, wanting to correct this very quickly, he said, actually, kiddo, God and Jesus are one. And Claire cut him off immediately and said, yeah, and I'm three, and I'll be four on my birthday. <laughs> so that didn't go well. <laughs> we actually just kind of looked at each other and shrugged our shoulders and didn't say anything else because we, we didn't really know how to fix that. We just tabled that conversation because it seemed a bit tricky thought we'd come back to it later. But tonight, we're not going to table this conversation. Because see, Psalm 1 holds answers to our questions. Who is God? What does God desire of me? It's all in there. And so we're going to do the work. And we're going to find those answers. You ready to move from reading to studying? All right, let's dig in. Let's look back at verse 1 again. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Let's start with that word blessed. Now this statement, it kind of sounds like a beatitude from the New Testament right here in the Old Testament. I don't know if you've ever read the Sermon on the Mount, but this was a sermon that Jesus preached. And Jesus said things like, blessed are the peacemakers, and blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And what Jesus was saying in the New Testament is that happy are those who live their life that way. And that's exactly what the psalmist is saying right here. This word blessed, it's the word esher. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you are given a blessing or that you're handed a reward. What it means is happiness or contentment. So right here in context, in Psalm 1, it says happy is the one who avoids wickedness and chooses faithfulness. Also, this particular word for blessed, it's a plural word, which indicates that there's a multiplicity of blessings. Much happiness is being poured out on the man or woman who chooses to walk a straight path. I mean, so far, so good, right? Sounds awesome. But then things kind of take a turn. Because, see, in this psalm, we are given three negatives, two positives, and a picture. And all of that is great, except for that our psalmist decides he's going to lead off with the negatives. And that doesn't really work for us in our culture. <laughs> we don't like that. But this is where we are. We are sinners in need of a Savior. We are wicked, and we need to be made wise. And so look at these three negatives, these three action words. They kind of intensify with each movement. Walk, stand, sit. See, when you walk with someone, you're associated with them. You are observing their counsel in your life. When you stand with them, you're showing agreement with who they are and what they believe in. And when you sit with them, you're doing life together. Now, all of that can be a good thing, but not so here. Because here, these words show a progression of sin. Because these three action words are accompanied with three terms for evil, which also happen to intensify with each one. 
The psalmist moves from wicked to sinners to mockers. Now, this word for wicked is a word used in the court of law. It's someone whose case has been heard and they've been found in the wrong. But sinners, sinners are those who are not just guilty of an isolated incident, but they continue on in their evil choices. And then mockers, mockers are both both evil and sinful. Yeah, but they're, they're truly the worst because mockers outwardly ridicule the righteous. They, they refuse to do anything that's on the right path. And because of their pride, they refuse to accept any kind of correction or instruction. Now, I wonder if these, these action words, sit, walk, stand, I wonder if these would, might ring a bell with some of you. Because way back in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we see Moses giving instructions for how to live to the Israelites. And this is what he says, starting in verse 5. He says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Did you see it? Talk about these things when you lie down, when you get up, when you walk, when you sit. These actions, they're not perfect parallels between Deuteronomy 6 and Psalm 1. But the Israelites would have made the connection. Because the sentiment is the same. I mean, what we're looking at here is a totality of experience. We are immersed and focused and committed to someone or something. And that dominates and shapes our worldview. Now, we get this in our culture, don't we? We know all about influencers. There's hundreds of influencers flowing through your gram right now. There are people who want to tell you how to do everything better, whatever you're into. You want to eat better, we'll tell you how. You want to cook better, we'll tell you how. You want to craft better, you want to work out better. Let me tell you how you can better homeschool your own dang kids, okay? There is somebody out there who wants to tell us how to do things better. But here's the deal. When it comes to living an upright life, we have got to believe that God's idea of better is always better than ours. So how do we avoid this enticing, this influential invitation into this death trap in verse 1? Well, it would seem that our anecdote is in verse 2. We separate ourselves from the world And we saturate ourselves in the word. Look at verse 1 and 2 together. Blessed is the one who does not walk with the wicked or stand with sinners or sit with mockers. But, here it is, whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on that law day and night. Separate and saturate. See, the instruction of God, it can do the exact same thing as all of these other influencers. It feeds and it shapes the mind and the heart of those who will give themselves over to the study of it. The word of God is true and it is powerful and it keeps the feet of those who read it firmly planted on the path of life. And how does it do that? Well, first we have to delight in it. Now, I'm going to be real with you. (laughs) There are a lot of things in this world that bring me delight. A nice piece of dark chocolate with a little sea salt sprinkled on there, mm, that's delightful. I already told you I love fall, and I love all the pumpkin spice things that come with it. I'm that girl. (laughs) Love it. Delightful. I delight in a good book, in a great movie. I delight in my family. But I am going to be honest with you, if I were to make a top ten list of my delights, I don't really know if the law of God would fall on there. (laughs) Like, I'm familiar with the laws. I know the Ten Commandments. I could probably quote them if I tried really hard. But I also know that there are like 613 other Levitical laws in Scripture. Laws about what to do if you have a flesh-eating disease. Kitchen laws, like don't cook a young goat in its mother's milk. I I don't know what to do with that. (laughs) But I'll tell you, I don't really delight in it. That seems weird. (laughs) But I have, I do have some delightful news for us. And that's this. 
that when we read these words, the law of the Lord here, we don't actually have to think of legality, but we can think of God's word in its entirety, all of it. We do have specific books of the Bible that we do call law because that's what they are. But the wording here in this psalm is the entire revelation of God. Actually, a better word would be instruction. We delight in the instruction given to us by God. One commentator puts it this way. Psalm 1 wants the whole of Scripture to be read as instruction. Instruction in prayer, instruction in praise, instruction in God's way with us and our way under God. And so we find delight, not just in the do's and the don'ts, but we find delight in the fact that God has given us this gift, his true word. And when we delight in that gift, do you know what we do? We obey it. Even Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And so we're to find delight in God's word, but it doesn't stop there. Verse 2 also says, then we meditate on it day and night. Now, I wonder if that word meditate conjures up any uncomfortable feelings in any of you. And it would make sense because here's what we know about meditation. It's a common practice in Eastern religions, right? And maybe some of you have even dabbled in some of those practices. Maybe you've used particular poses or particular sounds or particular smells, all with the goal of emptying your mind, right? But that's not the kind of meditation that this psalmist is talking about. See, the goal of Eastern meditation is to empty your mind completely, to make a blank space so that you can find inner peace. And I know that might sound really great, especially if you're a mom, <laughs> but it's actually really dangerous because a wide open mind is wide open to persuasion. And we have a lot of deceit right here in our very own hearts that can get up in there. But beyond that, there's plenty of deceit in this world. If you have a completely open and blank mind, there are demonic forces that would love to come in and take up residence there. And oh, the lies they will tell you. Now, this meditation is not about putting our mind in neutral. It is about putting our mind in drive and taking our hearts in the right direction. So if Eastern meditation is all about emptying the mind, what do you think Christian meditation is about? Filling it. Filling our mind with the word of God so that we can be ushered directly into his presence. Carefully thinking through each word and phrase and interaction. You know what the, the most common image is that scholars use when they're talking about this depth of study? It's a cow. Mm -hmm. Over and over, I saw it in my study, a cow chewing its cud. Now, I don't know how many of you gals are rural, but if you know, you know. A cow will go and pull up that grass with its teeth, and it will chew it, and chew it, and chew it, and then it finally swallows it, and then do you know what it does next? It regurgitates it, and it chews it some more. Yeah. It's kind of a disgusting image, but that is exactly what we're being told to do here. Read it, and study it, and study it, and take it piece by piece, and then do it again. Charles Spurgeon said that reading the word is good, but it's kind of like snacking or grazing at a banquet. But meditation is feeding on the word, devouring it and digesting it so that it can actually bring you nourishment. Meditation is all about quality over quantity. So not deciding one week, I'm going to read the whole gospel of Mark in five days. No, but sitting for five days with the woman with the issue of bleeding in Mark chapter 5, and just envisioning the compassion in Jesus' eyes, and envisioning the empathy in his touch, imagining the look on her face when she feels her body shift and she knows the blood has stopped. What would that be like? How would you respond? I mean, sit in that for five days and try not to be delighted. Amen? Amen. Meditation is fixing your mind on a particular truth. 
speaking to your heart about that truth and waiting for God to reveal himself through that truth. And Psalm 119 reminds us that God's word is the place to find that wise counsel. It is the only place to find truth. And this truth, it has the power to transform us. Let's keep looking, verse 3 and 4. It says, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, but not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. I want you to notice that word planted, ladies. Because those who faithfully study the word of God are not simply wild oaks that come about by happenstance. No, they are purposefully planted by the divine gardener. And they are planted in a place where they will receive everything they need. Just the right water, just the right sunlight, the clean air, so that they can't just grow, but they flourish. They don't just exist, they prosper. Now the prophet Jeremiah, he actually shares a very similar poem to Psalm 1. But before he even gets to this image of the tree planted by the river, he actually gives us a picture of contrast. He tells us what happens if we don't do this. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, he says, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. Now, honestly, this image would probably be an easier one to picture for the Israelites because they know the desert. This is where they live, and they know that next to nothing grows there. If you're actually going to see a tree grow, you have to plant it by a river next to water where it would always receive exactly what it needs, even if it never rains. That river is life in a dry and weary land. Now, I, too, understand this image quite well. I said before, we lived in Southern California for about a decade, and what I knew or very instantly when I got there is that this is a desert. In fact, Southern California has been in a consistent drought for almost 20 years. And what I learned was when you see someone's yard that is just green and lush and beautiful, you actually shouldn't be envious because they're probably going to get fined. <laughs> See, those, that grass and those flowers and those trees and those bushes, they don't just happen. Someone had to intervene to make that happen in that very dry place. And while it was beautiful, you're not really allowed to intervene for your own yard when half the state is in a drought. <laughs> now we, we are in a very dry and weary land, spiritually speaking, aren't we? It's very dry. It's very weary. But praise God for his intervention. See, we know that we don't have to waste away in the salt land. We don't have to wither up and fade away. We have everything we need. Jesus, in the New Testament, he told the woman at the well in John chapter 4 that he holds the water of life. And when we accept that gift from him, we will never be thirsty again. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 15 that he is the vine and we are the branches. And if we remain in the vine, attached and connected to the life source, we will be fruitful. But if branches are cut away from the vine, what good are they? They're nothing more than kindling for the fire. And so once again, we have these options. A tree planted by a river of life or a bush drying up in the wasteland. Well, I'm going to assume that this is a no-brainer, right? I mean, if we choose life, we see fruit. Right here, we have the promise of fruit. It's good. It's encouraging. But notice what it says about that fruit. It says that the fruit comes in seasons. And here's my fear. My fear is that that phrase, it comes in seasons, is actually more of a discouragement for some of you than it is an encouragement. Because we think, oh yeah, I get that. I pray and nothing happens. I practice my spirituality and nothing changes. I minister to these people night and day and they don't react, they don't respond. That's discouraging. 
But see, I think this line, which bears fruit in its season, is actually supposed to lift us up. Because we know this to be true about all fruit. The best strawberries come in May. Peaches are a summer fruit. Most apples are harvested in the fall. Now, can you get those fruit at any time? Sure. But man, do they taste better when you get them in the season in which they were made to produce, right? So that's what we're being told here. Just be patient. Just stick with it. If you remain rooted by this river of life, you will grow. And when you grow, you will produce fruit. And you know, I just bet that the longer you stay by that river, the more seasons of fruitfulness you experience. And then pretty soon, one season of fruitfulness just leads right into the next. So be faithful. Dig deep. Stay rooted and keep reading, studying, and obeying, and your fruit will come. And sisters, let me tell you, even seasonal fruit is better than the other option here. I mean, look at this contrast of the chaff, this paper-thin shell that comes away from the grain during harvest. I mean, the tree is well watered, but the, but the chaff, it's dry. The tree is connected to the earth, rooted in place, but the chaff is carried away by the wind. The tree is useful for so many things, primarily the fruit that it bears, but the chaff is useless. It's broken off. It's swept away. The rooted and well-watered tree has stability and endurance, but this husk, it's been beaten away from the seed, and it has no permanence, not now, not ever. And this image of contrast takes us into the final image of contrast in verses 5 and 6. It says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. A couple of words on the wicked and righteous. First of all, there is no in-between here. Take note of that. You are either walking in the way of the righteous or the way of the wicked. There is no dabbling. There is no waffling. There is no dipping a toe. They are altogether different and separate. Now that said, I want to be really clear about this. This call of the separation of the righteous and the wicked, this is about influence and behavior. This is not saying that the righteous should steer completely clear of wicked people and never interact with them. No, 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 no. It's simply another warning that influence is a real issue. So don't avoid the wicked, but be vigilant. Just like Jesus was when he would dine with sinners. He would stand firm in the power of the word of God. And so you need to make sure that you are the influencer and not the other way around. But Here's the second thing that I see here. This reference to the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked, it sounds a lot like the Sermon on the Mount again. Remember, Jesus began his Sermon on the Mount with blessed is the man, which is the same way Psalm 1 begins. And Jesus closes his sermon by talking about the wide and narrow gate. Here's what he says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. This passage has always reminded me of that Robert Frost poem, The Road Not Taken. You guys know that one? It starts, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood, and I looked down one as far I could. Now he goes on to talk about these two paths and how he noticed one was clearly more worn and it had a lot more travelers and he considers going down that path because it probably means an easier journey. But do you remember how the poem ends? He says, two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. Now I don't know whether Mr. Frost is a believer or not, but God makes a prophet out of whoever he wants, doesn't he? And so this poem has meant a lot of things to a lot of people, but for me, it has always been a helpful reminder that easier does not necessarily mean better, and difficulty oftentimes leads to delight. And Psalm 1, 5, and 6, I just, I think it rings so true with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. 
which says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. See, the way of the righteous is a straight path. Perhaps it's not well-worn and it is a bit narrow, but it is the path that will lead you to glory. And the path of the wicked, yeah, it's had a lot of travelers. It may seem easy and well-lit, but I promise you it is full of twists and turns and darkness and it will end in destruction. The wicked may look like they're quite prepared for life, but they are drastically unprepared for death. And so as we come to the end of this psalm, I just want you to notice there's no mention of a reward at the end of this if you choose the right path. And that's because the reward is the righteous path. If you take this path, a life lived in devotion to God and dedication to his word, that is a life worth living again and again and again. And so I suppose if I were to just summarize Psalm 1 for you, an answer to our initial questions of who is God and what does he desire of me, I would just simply say this. To know God is to be rooted in the word of God. To know God is to be rooted in in the word of God. Now, I don't know where each of you stand in your journey with God. I don't know how your study habits have been as of late. I imagine with a group this size, we probably run the gamut from non-existent to daily bread. (laughs) But here's the deal. This weekend, our challenge is to each and every one of you is to step up, to rise up, and to dig a little deeper. And our role is to try to answer as many of your questions as we can and maybe even answer some of the excuses. Well, I don't know how to study the word. No one ever taught me. I never learned. Great. That's what we're going to do tomorrow, so please come back. (laughs) Well, I don't really understand it. I've tried to read it and study it before, but it doesn't make any sense to me. You know what? We've got tools for you. We have resources that we want to introduce to you. We can help you with that. Well, it's always seemed kind of impersonal. Like, I don't really even know if it was written for me, you know? Man, come back in the morning and join us for meditation. We have something we want you to try. I think you'll like it. Well, I've tried studying the word, and nothing changed. And I don't have time for something if it's not going to bring results. Let me tell you a story. Imagine that you are camping in the woods. Now, I know, I just lost a third of the room. Camping? Are you kidding me? (laughs) No, okay. It's an analogy, people. Go with me here, all right? You are camping in the woods. And you wake up one morning, and you step out of your tent, and you realize it's been snowing all night. And you look out, and it is white, and, and it's cold, but it's pristine, and it's beautiful. And you think to yourself, I want to take a walk in the snow. And so you put on your coat, and you put on your hat, and you put on your gloves, and you take off into the woods. And you're walking along, and it continues to snow all around you. I mean, it is quite literally like walking in a winter wonderland. And as you're walking, you pass by some really beautiful trees, and there's a frozen stream, and you see this really cool rock formation, and... You keep walking and see some more trees and another frozen stream and this really cool rock. Oh, no. You've seen these rocks before. You realize you're lost. And because the snow has continued to fall, you have no idea where you are. You can't see where you came from. You don't know where you're going. And it is only growing colder. You're starting to lose feeling in your fingers and in your toes. And just about the time that you begin to panic, you look up and right over the top of the trees, you see a billow of smoke. And where there's smoke, there's fire. And so you take off through those trees like a shot. You know this is your only hope. It is only a matter of time before you see a very traumatic end. And so you work your way through that forest and finally you come to a clearing in the trees and right there in the middle of the meadow is the most perfect cabin. It's got cute little curtains in the window and there's that billow of smoke coming right out of the chimney on top. And so you walk boldly up to that door and you knock and nobody answers. 
So you knock again. I mean, this is, this is your only hope. But it's clear, nobody's there. And so you say a little prayer, and then you try the latch, and lo and behold, that door swings wide. And what you see in front of you is the most glorious fire burning in the fireplace. And even better than that, there's something delicious boiling in a pot on top. And so you walk up to that fire. I mean, it just looks like an invitation. No, it looks like rescue. And you take off those ice-crusted gloves and you turn your hands this way and that. And then you step away from the fire, put back on your icy gloves, step outside, close the door, and hope against hope you can find your way back to camp. (laughs) Wait, no, what? Does that make any sense? Are you even warm? No, of course not. You know what to do to get warm after a long, dark, and cold journey. You have got to sit yourself down by that fire And stay there. Ladies, I wonder how many of you have been walking a pretty dark journey as of late. Has your world turned cold? Are you looking for the path but you just can't seem to find it? Did you come here this weekend with questions? You want to see God? You want to know what God desires of you? Well, here's what we desire for you. Our desire is that in the coming days and weeks and months and even years that you will sit down and you will open up the written word and there you will find the living word. But if you're going to find answers to those questions, if you're going to find that right path, you're going to have to linger by the fire. Because staying for a while is the only way to get warm. To know God is to be rooted in the word of God. Ladies, here in just a little bit, we're going to worship together again. And while we are singing, we want to invite you to use this time and to use this space to respond in whatever way you feel the Holy Spirit is moving you. You may have noticed there's some stickers up here on the stairs. And on these stickers is a tree, a tree with some pretty cool roots. We want you all to come and take a sticker. And we want you to put that sticker in your books as a reminder of Psalm chapter 1, as a reminder of what it looks like to plant yourself by the river of living water. And so maybe that's all the response you need. But others of you, you may need to pray. You may need to spend some time up here alone praying, asking God to lead you back to that right path, to lead you to holiness. Some of you may need to pray for conviction. God, I know I need to open up that Bible. I need to dust it off first, and then I need to open up that Bible. So pray for God's wisdom, for his discernment as you study his words again for the first time. Maybe some of you would like someone to pray with you. We're going to have some women stationed over here by the baptistry. They would be happy to pray with you, for you, over you. Maybe there are some of you here tonight who are here for the very first time and you are ready to just respond to the word of life. You are ready to respond to Jesus and you want to be baptized. We can make that happen. So we're going to give you that time and that space to respond in whatever way you want. But ladies, can I just tell you, I walked around for eight years of my life only partially being able to see. And living with blurry vision is no way to live at all. But when I looked up at that tree, my vision became whole. My vision was made complete. And so if you do nothing else tonight, this is our invitation. Commit yourself to digging in deep. Plant yourself by the river of living water. Stick those roots down deep in that rich soil and glean from those nutrients, glean from that word. And I promise you, as you begin to grow and as you bloom and as you bear fruit, you will see. Your vision of God 
will be made whole. Let me pray for you. God, our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word and we are thankful for the life that it breathes into our souls. God, we recognize that it is a gift that you did not have to give us, but we have it and we accept it and we are grateful for it. And God, our prayer for this weekend is that you would light a fire inside of us to know those words, to ingest those words, to grow through those words, God, to be made healthy through your word. We thank you for the presence that you have given us through your Holy Spirit to help us understand these words. Would you also help us to lean into this community around us as accountability, people who can hold our feet to that fire and remind us that these words are life and without them we are done for, God. Thank you for this gift. God, place a conviction in our bones to not take this gift for granted, to not take it lightly, but to absorb it for all it is. God, and help us to not just take it in for ourselves, but also spread it to everyone around us, God. Help us to share the joy, to share that life with others. Your love is incredible, God. It is indescribable. It is something yeah, we, we just don't have words for it, but we're thankful for it. We thank you for that love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your presence, and we thank you for your word. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.